What's up, bros and broettes? Today we're talking about everyone's favorite topic. Models. Woo! Yeah, that's right. Mm. The effective reps model to be uh, exact. Oh, the models. This is bullshit. Why? 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 It's promised models. You don't like education? Okay, fine. This is going to help you get more jacked to help your chances. I'm an incel. With normal models. So, the effective reps model is the idea that the last five reps of any set are the quote-unquote effective reps. So, they are going to be more effective than the previous reps that you did. So, if you do a set of ten, those last five reps are really the only ones that count. Now, it's been said before that all models are wrong, but some are useful. I don't know what type of models they're referring to, but I'm going to assume this applies to the effective reps model too. Now, the first issue would be rest times. Now, it's been shown that if you take longer rests and the volume is equated, the longer rest times are actually going to be more effective for hypertrophy. Now, if the effective reps model was true in a very strict sense, it would just be, oh, no matter how many sets you do to failure, as long as you're getting that same five reps per set, hypertrophy is going to be equal. But that's not the case, most likely because you're getting central fatigue. So if you do a set of squats, and then you go again a minute later to failure again, then you go again another minute later, your performance is going to rapidly decline. Maybe you get 20 reps on the first set, then you get eight on the next one, and then maybe you're down to like four or five reps on that last one. Whereas if you took longer rests, your level of performance would be better. This is because you are probably going to be limited by your cardiovascular system. You just can't get enough uh, nutrients and oxygen and fuel to the muscles to actually take them close to failure. So it's not actually your muscles that are failing, it's your cardiovascular system. Whereas for an isolation movement, you know, a cable lateral raise or, or a biceps curl or something like that, I would say the effective reps model is a lot more robust because the cardiovascular system and the central nervous system are much less of limiting factors. Issue number two is technical failure. I've seen this many times where someone actually genuinely did go to failure, but they're probably not actually getting as many effective reps as they think. If you're doing a squat and you fail because of your ability to brace or stability or balance or something like that, you probably are not going to be training your legs to their maximum capabilities. And this is one of the reasons why you need a minimum level of stability in order to actually get effective reps at all. If you're doing a pistol squat on a BOSU ball, that's probably not going to be effective for hypertrophy just because the limiting factor is almost always going to be your balance or possibly your mobility, not the actual muscles that you're presumably trying to train. Next, compound versus isolation. These should be treated quite differently, both in your programming, your proximity to failure, and the amount of effective reps that they are theoretically going to give you. For example, there is some evidence that with a compound movement, the prime movers are more active than you would think further away from failure. So for example, in a squat, the quads might actually be tapped out way earlier than you think, and then as you get closer to failure, other muscles tend to chip in. I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I actually tweaked my hamstring. Now, I could still squat. I couldn't do RDLs. I couldn't do hinges. I couldn't do Nordic hamstring curls. I couldn't do direct work for it. But I could still squat as long as I stayed quite upright. If I squatted low bar, it would bother it. High bar was okay if I stayed very upright. However, the closer I went to failure, the more I could feel the hamstring. Because as you go closer to failure, most people will tend to shift the hips back a little bit and to get more hip and lower back involvement, turning it into slightly more of a hinge. So it does depend on how you do it. And the prime movers might be more active when you're not even all that close to failure. And Greg Knuckles summed this up really well in an article. He said something like, the knees slash quads do what they can, the hips do what they must. So when your quads are tapped out, the load will shift a little bit more to the hips and you'll good morning the weight up. Same thing with a bench press. The chest might be more active, not as close to failure as you think, and then it's more front delt and more triceps in those last few grindy reps. And so you do have to take into account effective reps for what? 
okay? So if you're doing a bench press, yeah, you're training your chest, but someone might ask, well, how many effective reps is it for triceps? Well, it depends on your technique. It depends on your leverages. It depends on, on your personal strengths. If your triceps are really strong, it might be more triceps in some movements. If you're, you know, 52 kilo female powerlifting your bench press up with a massive arch, you're getting like this much range of motion at the triceps. It might be almost no triceps, especially because this is the extended position, not the stretched position. But if you bring your grip into a more moderate amount, all of a sudden it's more range of motion at the elbow. If you use a close grip bench press, like around here, all of a sudden it's almost full range of motion at the triceps. So it depends on how you do it as well. And it's incredibly difficult to actually try to predict how many effective reps for what area when you're how close to failure. And so your technique absolutely matters. Just training to failure is not enough. I've seen some people where they're doing like dumbbell overhead press and they're half repping it and they're somehow like doing it like this. That's probably zero effective reps or maybe one or two per set, even if you go to failure. But if you're using full range of motion, you're controlling the eccentric, pausing at the bottom, really controlling everything, that is going to be much more effective, even if they're both to failure. You also do have to take into account biarticulate, biarticular, one of those, muscles which cross two joints, okay? So for example, the rectus femoris, it is a quadricep muscle, so it's going to extend the knee, but it also flexes the hip. So when you're squatting down and then standing back up, it wants to participate in knee extension, but it also wants to participate in hip flexion but you're squatting, so you want hip extension. So the rectus femoris is going to be quite silent when you are squatting. So Silence! it's possible you're getting effective reps for the other heads of the quadricep, but zero effective reps for the rectus femoris. Same thing with the hamstrings. During squats, they extend the hip, but they also flex the knee. But during a squat, you want knee extension. Therefore, the hamstrings overall are going to be fairly silent, but it does depend on how you do it. If you're using you know, a wide stance, you're sitting back more, it's going to be relatively more hips. Therefore, they're going to be more active. If you're doing a front squat and you're staying very upright, it's going to be more knees and the hamstrings barely will be used at all. So again, it depends on your leverages and how you are moving. Your motor cortex, it is one smart motherfucker. It really is. It will recruit exactly what is needed to get the job done. Same thing with the triceps long head. It participates in elbow extension, but it also participates in shoulder extension as well. So if you're doing an overhead press, yeah, it wants to help extend here, but it also wants to help do this. That's the opposite of what you're trying to do. Therefore, it's going to be quite silent in many compound movements then there are certain parts of various muscles that don't do what you think they do. So for example, the hamstring short head is not going to be involved with hip extension at all. It doesn't cross the hip, so it doesn't do that at all. So if you're like, yeah, I'm doing RDLs, training the short head, you're not, you're not. You gotta do some kind of curl if you want to target that area. So a back extension or a deadlift or something like that it is zero effective reps for that tissue. And this is where if you want to maximize your entire physique, squat, bench, deadlift, it's not going to be enough. So, so bodybuilding style training, the exercise selection is going to have to be a lot more varied compared to just being a power lifter. Your periodization and your progression probably doesn't have to be as complex, but in terms of exercise selection, absolutely. And for more about that, definitely grab a copy of my book. Consider this to be a mid-roll ad. I am sponsoring this video myself because, you know, why the fuck not? So definitely grab a copy of that if you are interested in bringing your training knowledge to the next level. Number six is the mind-muscle connection. Now, I do think that certain content creators, especially the enhanced ones, do seem to put this on a little bit of a pedestal. It's not as important as a lot of other factors, but it is certainly a factor, especially for some areas. For example, if you're doing a row and you want to target your lats, 
there are half a dozen other muscles that can take over in a pretty dramatic way. So it could be more rear delts, could be more traps, uh, could be more teres, it could be more biceps, it could be more forearms, okay? It could be more side delts, could be more spinal erector, could be more hips, okay? So there's a lot of other muscles that can take over from that muscle group, especially if it is a weak point. So you might need to reduce the weight and really focus on activating certain areas. I know this sounds very bro-y, but in just in terms of effective reps, it might be very few effective reps for the area that you're trying to target. So if you have a weak point, you're probably better off focusing not on just adding sets, but on doing the sets in a way that actually targets the area that you want to target. And I've definitely fallen into this trap before myself, and I've noticed it happens to quite a few people who are maybe a little bit over-focused on progression, but it's easy to let your form go down the drain, and then now you're working every area except the one you are presumably targeting. Number seven, it doesn't take into account effort. Now, I'm not one of these, like, train harder than last time guys. Like, effort is not everything, but it certainly is a factor. So how do you recruit higher threshold motor units? Well, there's three main ways. First, you train explosively, aggressively. You're trying to move the weight as quickly as possible. Two, you train near failure. Three, you train heavy. So if you do three reps with your five rep max, you're still getting, you know, very, very high levels of motor unit recruitment, even from the first rep, even on six rep max, you know, you're still getting those higher threshold motor units firing. What do these three have in common? Explosiveness, failure, heavy. They're all high effort. And I think that is actually going to be what is more important compared to failure. I would rather have someone give a completely all out effort, but leave those two reps in the tank compared to it's like, you know, they're sort of going through the motions and oh, like, oh, I failed. Oh, look at that. I failed. I see that all the time where someone's failure is not actually failure. They're just going through the motions. They look bored. They're basically on their fucking phone in the set. This is not going to be what gets the job done. It might even be that failure is not particularly important, but the effort definitely is. Next, the resistance curve of the movement. Now, there's more and more research coming out on an almost weekly basis on how the lengthened part of the range of motion is going to be relatively more important. They've done it on leg extensions, leg curls. There's now one for overhead extensions. They've done it on a bunch of different movements. And so... If the effective reps model was true, it would basically mean that every exercise is the same. So if you do your leg extensions at the top or at the bottom, well, they're both equally near failure. It should be both equally same number of effective reps. Therefore, the results should be the same, but they're not. And the reality is not every exercise is the same. I know that sounds shocking, but you can't just say, oh, you within failure, five reps, they're effective, boom, done. No, every exercise is going to be different. A leg extension and a squat, a squat is just going to be more effective, efficacious for hypertrophy. Point blank, probably because it is working the lengthened position of the quadriceps more than the leg extension. For example, on something like a chest-supported row, where it's most challenging in the contracted position not the lengthened, a five reps in reserve set, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's not even a warm up, right? Like it's just a complete waste of time in my opinion. Using reps in reserve on like lateral raises uh, or rear delt raises or spider curls, anything where it's most difficult in that contracted position, it's pretty much a waste of time. And I would highly encourage people to make failure the default on those exercises and it's not even as mentally challenging because again you're only really hitting failure in that small part of the range of motion and you can keep going if you really want to yes it is technically beyond technical failure but it might actually be more effective and this is where the effective reps model kind of breaks down a little bit so high intensity techniques kind of are difficult to account for if you only go to failure the five reps before that were effective well, what happens if you do partials? What happens if you do slow eccentric? What happens if you do cheat reps? Okay. I've seen some people, they do cheat curls and they are getting fewer effective reps because they're just flailing around. They're like 
throwing it up, trying to catch it, just bringing it back down. It's basically almost nothing, almost no tension on the biceps. Other people, they're getting the slow grindy reps, controlling the eccentric, cheating just enough where it's still difficult and challenging. Tension and activation are what actually trigger muscle growth, not just being close to failure, especially if you're flailing around like, oh, I had technical failure, oh no. No, it's the actual experiences of the muscle. Next, the effective reps model is stating that five reps in reserve, four, three, two, one, each one of those reps as you get closer to failure is going to be equal. I'm not entirely sold on this. Is that sixth rep away from failure nothing? It's probably something. I mean, if you do a shitload of volume, especially on big movements, keeping five reps in the tank, you're probably still going to grow, especially if you are more of a beginner. If you do a bunch of sets of deadlift, keeping five reps in the tank, that's still a lot of stress on your posterior chain, on your back, on your grip, etc. So the idea that six reps in reserve, seven, eight, nine reps in reserve is just nothing, I don't believe this for a second. And watching a lot of power lifters train, a lot of them are keeping a shocking number of reps in reserve, and yet they are still growing. Furthermore, it doesn't actually take into account the difference between zero reps in reserve and failure. A lot of people think those things are synonymous. They're not. A lot of people will say, oh, I took a set to failure, but they succeeded on that last rep. They think, oh, I can't get another one, therefore it's failure. No, you didn't actually fail. It was zero reps in reserve, but it wasn't failure. So every failure set is zero reps in reserve, but not every zero reps in reserve set is failure. And the model doesn't quite take that into account. You know, if you really are trying on that last rep and you, oh, I failed. Is that, that just doesn't count for anything? It's just no stimulus at all? Hmm. Finally, it's going to be fairly individual. It depends on your training history. It depends on your fiber type, most likely, uh, what you've been through, what you've been doing lately. It's going to change for each individual over time. For example, I mentioned if I did five reps in reserve on rows, I don't think I would get anything out of that because I'm so used to taking literally every sing single set of rows to failure and then doing partials on top of that that keeping five reps in reserve away from failure, it just wouldn't do anything. I'm quite certain that I would probably lose size doing that because my body is used to like this level of stress and now it's getting this level of stress. So why would I grow from that even if it was like theoretically getting one effective rep on paper? In reality, it's zero effective reps for me given my training history and given what I've been doing up until that point. And so someone can make a theoretical curve of like how effective the effective reps are. Like, oh, is it exponential? Like, do you get more stimulus the closer you go to failure? Or does it sort of taper off and you get this little, and you can point to studies, but it's still going to be individual. And there are gonna be people who should probably never train to failure because for them it's more fatiguing and they get more from not going to failure. So they get effective reps further away from failure and they get less from going to failure. The fatigue is higher, the stimulus is not gonna be as great. And so it is super individual. And I do think the, the model has merit, okay? This is not me taking a big old dump on the model. I think it is one of the better ones out there and it has stood the test of time, but it's also important to realize that it is not everything. And so it's going to take a lot of personal experimentation. I can handle a lot of work to failure, a lot of work past failure, just a high volume of training, something that would bury someone else. And I'm not saying that to brag. In fact, in some ways it's better if you can get away with doing less, if you can train further away from failure. It's easier on the body and there's less fatigue to deal with. Just due to, could be my fiber type, could be my training history, could be my endurance background, could be a lot of different factors, but this is just what I need to grow. It's not gonna be what is gonna work for everyone and you do have to take an individualized approach to training. For more tasty training tidbits, consider grabbing a copy of my book. There is lots of information there that can actually help you to individualize your training to yourself. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.